Many people ask me, why do you, as a journalist, cover wars? Isn't it much safer to report on, for instance, the economy, or to cover fashion shows? Other people ask me, why do you, as a woman, cover wars? Isn't war very much a male thing? Why do you want to be there? And wouldn't it be more logical that you raise a family or find a, no a normal job? The main question also that I get is, why do you as a human being willingly visit places which are seriously dangerous and where you can get killed in an instant or even worse, lose your arms or legs? I also don't know exactly what to answer when people ask me all these questions because in a way it is also a mystery to me why I, why I decided to go to my first war and why I ever since keep on going back to conflict zones. Two weeks ago or so, I came back from a trip through northern Syria with moderate rebels. Let me just show you this part of one of my reports that I made there, just so you can get an idea of the situation that I, that I was in and how I work. Because pictures sometimes say are better than a thousand words. علينا أن نمشي بسرعة وبشكل منخفض الخندق يؤدي في نهاية المطاف إلى خط المواجهة حيث يصوب المقاتلون بنادقهم باتجاه مواقع الجيش النظامي نحن الآن على الخط الأمامي في وادي الضيف طبعا العناصر النظامية أو الحواجز التابعة للنظام السوري تبعد حوالي ال400 متر من هنا لا نستطيع أن نراهم بشكل لا نستطيع أن نراهم بشكل واضح ذلك لأنه هناك خناصة متمركزة على الطرف الآخر وبالطبع يعني هناك خوف من استهدافنا هذا هو طبعا هذا خناصة تابع لي الجبهة ثوار سوريا للجيش الحر وهم مرابطون هنا على مدار الساعة ننتقل إلى موقع آخر يجب أن نسحف في نفق صغير لنصل إلى هناك من هنا نستطيع أن نرى مواقع النظام بشكل أوضح يوجد في وادي الضيف أكثر من ألف جنديا محاصر وحوالي الثلاثين دبابة هذا قناص ينتظر ويراقب ثم يطلق النار كثرت التقارير مؤخرا على أن المعارضة حصلت على أسلحة ثقيلة من الخارج ولكنهم هنا على الأرض يفتقرون للقنابل المتطورة يطلقون بوساطة مدفع جهنم قنابل مصنوعة من أسطوانات الغاز محلية الصنع تنفجر على الطرف الآخر تليها لحظات توتر بعد أن قام جنود النظام بالرد على مصدر إطلاق النار بدأت معركة وادي الضيف في أكتوبر 2012 حتى اليوم لم تتمكن المعارضة من الحسم ولم يتمكن النظام من فك الحصار لذلك يقضي الطرفان وقتهم في المرابطة حتى تقترب ساعة الصفر جينا نمسى أخبار الآن من وادي الضيف سوريا but Egypt 2011 was my first real conflict that I covered as a journalist. On the 1st of January of that year, I was made roving reporter of Al An Television, which is based here in Dubai. So four weeks later, I arrived in Cairo, trying to cover what some people called a revolution. On day one, I got in the middle of a huge fight between Mubarak opponents and Mubarak support supporters. We ran into a hotel, which was soon after surrounded by demonstrators. Some people tried to storm the building. In the meantime, from my balcony, I could see huge fights in front of the hotel between different protesters. The army tried to separate the people, but to no avail. I saw how people shot each other to death and how they beat each other to death. The next day, I tried to escape from the hotel, which by now stood in the middle of a war zone. But my taxi was stopped by thugs, 
Within seconds, 10 people surrounded the vehicle. Seconds later, there were 50. They had sticks and knives and baseball bats. And when they smashed the front window and tried to kill the spy, this is how they view journalists, I was convinced I would be dead within the minute. There was nothing I could do. Sitting on the back seat of an old Egyptian Mercedes, I waited to die way too young. Tears filled my eyes, but at the last moment, really the last, last moment, out of nowhere, an Egyptian soldier ran towards my taxi and jumped into it. He shouted to the crowd and pointed his gun towards them. Move, he yelled at the driver of the taxi. Scared for the weapon-waving soldier, the crowd with their sticks and their knives and their hate opened like the Red Sea. Two minutes later, he dropped us at, the, at an army post. Just as quickly as the soldier had arrived, he again disappeared. I never got his name. I will always remember him as my anonymous savior in green. Egypt was for me the beginning. After it, Libya started. Because Egypt had been so terrible, I thought maybe Libya would be a bit safer. But it wasn't. <laughs> we once drove with rebels in a convoy on a long and straight desert road. Rebels had told me already that at one point today, we probably will run into a Gaddafi ambush. I told the rebels they should maybe stop every couple of kilometers and look through binoculars for Gaddafi troops. But they said this was not necessary. We decided to drive behind a bus full of rebels. And so it happened. Suddenly, we drove into a hailstorm of bullets. We were with five people in the car, and we all panicked like crazy. The driver stopped the car. We got out and hid behind it. Bullets flew around us. We were scared to stay there, so we jumped in the car again, turned it, and drove back like madmen. In front of us, the bus with the rebels in it was hit. Something like four rebels and it died. I always think that the bus saved our lives. Here I'm going to show you the moments that we hid behind that car and came under fire. <laughs> After Egypt and Libya, the war started in Syria. Of course, I also went there because I thought it might be a better, a be better and safer than Libya. But again, it wasn't. Syria until now is an uncomparable to anything I've seen or experienced. Syria is a million Egypts and a thousand Libyas. Some say the Syrian war is the Lebanese war on speed. I honestly have never seen anything like Syria. I was staying with rebels in Aleppo, hours of shelling, grenades slamming into nearby buildings, then the planes, the dove and screaming sounds in the early morning towards the house we were staying in. They dropped their bombs and whole buildings in the street collapsed. Or the helicopters, those terrible helicopters, they fire rockets or they drop barrel bombs. It was 8.30 when we were having breakfast in a house in Syria. Out of nowhere, a huge explosion. We thought we were dead. In utter shock did we run to a basement. Smoke and dust from new attacks. Wounded people covered in blood ran through the streets. Only the dead did not move. We hid in a shelter, but the building above it was hit and the whole structure now trembled. I was so scared that the 10 floors of concrete would collapse on us. Children next to me started to cry. This was horror, like you hardly ever experience. Let's watch these moments together. The clip does not have any English subtitles, but I think it's clear. يزداد القصف نهرب إلى ملجأ قريب أصوات الانفجارات لا تتوقف هنا يحتمي المدنيون لا يسعنا إلى الانتظار But Syria is not only state terror, it is also an endless amount of rebel groups who often all hate each other and all want to kill each other. 
Some are so radical that even Al-Qaeda has said that they are crazy. They kidnap, they kill, they rob, they destroy. So on the ground in Syria, I'm not only scared for the regime planes and bullets, but also scared to be kidnapped or killed by other rebel groups. But enough stories about how dangerous it is in conflict zones and how scared I often am. Let's go back to the questions. Why do we journalists do this? Why do we see thousands of refugees walking away from a war zone? And why do we journalists go in the opposite direction into the war? I think there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, why do I go there as a journalist? Well, very simple. If you are currently a reporter in the Middle East, you kind of have to go because these are the main stories. They're all connected to uprisings, wars, crises, violence, and trouble. If I would be a journalist in Australia, I might report on kangaroos, I don't know, but I'm not in Australia. Just like the wars in Bosnia, Kosovo, and now in the Ukraine have created a generation of European journalists who cover wars, the so-called Arab Spring, too, has created a generation of Arabic crisis reporters. Sure, you can use the safety of your office and analyze the whole day long about what will happen tomorrow, as is widely done in Arabic journalism. But to me, a journalist works away from the house, away from the office, the street is eventually where you find your stories. Secondly, war attracts some journalists like myself because I consider it to be the most challenging form of journalism. Compare it to a policeman. Most policemen rather would like to investigate a murder than to investigate the disappearance of a cat, for example. Not because they like murders, but because a murder investigation fascinates them. It interests them. It gives them the feeling that they do something important and useful. Of course, it also plays a, a role that I am a highly competitive journalist. I want to crack stories first. I want to visit certain places first. I remember that I managed to reach Timbuktu in Mali as the first Arabic journalist after the French had attacked extremist groups there. But just to reach Timbuktu, it almost took a week of driving. But what a satisfaction when you reach that magical city. This is one of the pictures at the entrance of Timbuktu. Fourthly, I visit war areas as a journalist because I want to see things with my own eyes. In this age of office and internet journalism, less reporters actually report. More and more reporters only sit behind their computer and search on the internet for stories. Copy, paste, and again, you've got another story. Especially on websites, you can notice that some journalists write 10 or 20 stories a day. These journalists have no idea if the story is actually true or if the information is correct. They just copy-paste and find a proper picture with it. How easy it is to serve the world on the internet. You can go with your mouse from Argentina to Mali, from Turkey to Afghanistan, all in seconds. But in real life, it takes ages, days to get somewhere. My trip to Myanmar, where Muslims are being treated very unfairly, took two weeks to organize. Endless flights, endless drives, endless talks, weeks of organizing and negotiating with various people. So yes, I want to see it all with my own eyes, because seeing is understanding, and understanding creates better journalism. Why do I go as a war as a female journalist? Because I think that female journalists can do the same thing as male reporters. Even in male-dominated parts of the world as the Middle East, that's why I, I and other female crisis reporters do what we do. Because it's just not different. I try to show my audience that female reporters are not necessarily more scared. That we can do the easy and safe stories. No, that's not true. And don't be fooled by people who say it is safer for men or for women in wars. Because it isn't. Bullets and grenades generally are not gender biased. And as a female crisis reporter, I have often better access to male fighters because most of them don't see me as a threat. They rather want to impress me and tell me a lot of stories, which is very good for me as a journalist. At the same time, as a female reporter, I can also easily get in touch with the female population in a war. 
as male reporters often cannot talk to females in many parts of the Middle East, the voice of 50% of the population would go lost if there were only male war reporters. So yes, I can talk to women, meet them in their houses, interview them, tell the world their stories. I think this is really important. Lastly, why do I visit war areas as a human being? I think it's important to give a voice to humans who are generally silenced by guns. And personally, I find it an overwhelming feeling when I walk around in areas where history is being made in front of my eyes. Egypt, Libya, Syria, all history in the making. I will never forget how I stood in a refrigerated container in the Libyan city of Misrata. Few centimeters from me laid a dead Muammar Gaddafi on the floor. Next to him was one of his sons and his minister of defense. Although the smell in the container was bad and it was difficult to look at the three dead men, I felt amazement that I was there. Exactly what a journalist should be, a witness to history. Thank you for your attention.